Call a meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. Um, we'll do. I'm Dale Stein, Chair. Darren? Darren Hickling, voting member. Dave? Dave Brass, Vice Chair, voting member. Scott? Scott Ryan, NYOCD, voting rep. Thank you, everyone. Ryan, over to you. Sure, I'll do advisory members and then staff, and then I'll uh, just give a welcome to all others on the line today. Unfortunately, we won't have the time to go through introductions to everybody. But I'll start out with uh, Agon Markets Advisory Member Agency. Anyone from Agon Markets on? How about, how about Cornell Cal? EVEA? Hey, Brian, Dustin Lewis here. Hi, right, Dustin. Thank you. Cornell Cooperative Extension? Yeah, Beth is here. Brian, you're a little soft. We, I can't, just like, uh, yeah, you're a little soft anyway. I tried to turn the volume up. But. Okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do here. Um, does that sound any better? Yeah, it does. Okay, great. Thank you, Beth. Welcome. Uh, DEC. Morning, Brian. Sarah Latessa's on. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. The Region 7's on, too. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first name. Was that Julie? Julie, yep. Okay, thank us. you. Good morning. Oh, and there's the, there's another Julie. Good morning, Julie. Anyone else from DEC? Okay, Department of Health. Hi, this is Paul Kaczmarczyk. Hi, Paul. And Morgan Tarbo. Hi, Morgan. Morning. Department of State. Oh. Good morning. This is uh, Stephanie Boytevich, uh, and Kate is not with us today. She's in the Florida Keys, so. <laughs> oh, lucky her. Okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Stephanie. Welcome. That's not an excuse. I'm down here too. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Dale. Good point. <laughs> I'll give her a call right now. <laughs> That's right. Have her get her uh, have her get her webex fired up. Um, <laughs> Good morning, Brian. This is Steve Shaw. Good morning, Steve. USDA NRCS. Good morning, Brian. Blake. Good morning, Blake. All right, am I missing any advisory members? Okay, um, staff might be a little light right now. There is also a water quality symposium, virtual symposium going on. So I will um, start off with Victor on the line. Good morning, Victor Giacomo, Regional Field Staff for Western New York. Good morning, Vic. TJ. Morning. TJ on the line. How about Scott Thickbaum? Hello, everyone. Scott Thickbaum, Regional Coordinator for Central New York. Good morning, Scott. Ryan Cunningham. Good morning, everyone. Ryan Cunningham here, Regional Field Staff for the North Country. Good morning, Ryan. Greg Albrecht. Good morning, Greg Albrecht, AIM Program Coordinator with the State Committee. Good morning, Greg. Ron Bush. Good morning, Brian. Ron Bush, Nutrient Management Planning Specialist. Good morning, Ron. Brendan Jordan. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Brendan Jordan, CNMP Specialist with the State Committee. Good morning, Brendan. Ben Lufkin. Good morning, Ben Lutkin, Region 5 AEA and State Aid to Districts Program Manager. Good morning, Ben. Jennifer Clifford. Good morning, Jennifer Clifford, CRF Program Manager. Good morning, Jennifer. Bethany Bizdu. Good morning, everybody. Bethany Bizdu, Agnon Point Source Program Manager. Good morning, Bethany. Abigail Edwards. 
Good morning, everyone. Abigail Edwards, Excelsior Fellow. Good morning, Abigail. Tim Clark? All right, I believe Tim is in the alternative manure management class right now. Uh, Lauren Pazorski. Okay, um, as we are uh, going through our staff roll call, I do have one announcement to make to, for everybody. Um, since our last meeting, just want to note that uh, Pete Lopez, who was serving as a special assistant for climate policy and renewable energy, um, has left the department. Uh, he will be or is working at Cena Cutson. And, um, you know, in a short time that we had an opportunity to work with Pete, I was um, just floored, of course, with his level of knowledge and experience in public policy um, with over a 40 year career. And he really helped us move the ball uh, forward quite a bit in a short period of time. So he will be missed. And I'm sure if he was here, he would, uh, he would um, love to have, uh, you know, said, uh, hello and goodbye to everybody in person, but uh, Pete Lopez no longer no longer with the department. Um, so just wanted to make that quick announcement. Um, and welcome to everyone else on the line here today, all our conservation districts, district board members, and members of the public. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Dale, before we go into the agenda, I did want to note that there was a, um, a little bit of an update since the agenda was sent out in the meeting announcement. And um, that update Not primarily good. is to the Climate Resilient Farming Program, where we will be uh, discussing uh, potential um, support for an emissions measurement and monitoring research proposal. So um, that will come later. Good. Thank you, Brian. Review, you, and Review and approve minutes. Are there any additions or corrections or changes, anyone? Get a motion to approve. So move, move. Second. Second. <laughs> Second. I will go to voting. Uh, Darren. Aye. Dave. Aye. Scott. Yes. Approved. Thank you. Correspondence, Brian. Budget update. Sure. I I do have correspondence <clears throat> here, but I'm going to just go through quickly staff and budget update, uh, and then we'll um, go into <clears throat> correspondence. Um, Staff, we, we did receive approval uh, to backfill the data management GIS specialist position uh, that was um, recently vacated by Jason Kokinos. And uh, Bethany and I will be going through a series of resumes and setting up interviews. So um, that solicitation went out and um, we do have some, some resumes, qualified candidates, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to, to meeting with uh, with them and, and uh, filling that position. Um, we also finally received uh, approval to backfill our Division of Land and Water Resource Office um, assistant position. Um, so this will be a position that will help us with scheduling of meetings, help us with all of our uh, correspondence and keeping our email addresses um, current. Um, to, uh, that will help Maureen Irish uh, quite a bit in, in, in those efforts, and those interviews are scheduled for later this month. Mike and I will be conducting those. Um, I don't really have much of a budget update at this point in time. I do know that the budget negotiations are certainly um, up and running and uh, anticipate a, an approved budget uh, uh, somewhere close to April 1st. So at our next meeting, we'll have, we'll have an update on that. Um, I just want to remind everybody, please keep your phone on mute. If you're not speaking, that would be great. And I will go into correspondence at this point in time. We do have a letter that was written by Corey Nellis, Montgomery County Soil and Water District Manager to Dale Stein, State mm -hmm. Committee. Uh, this was addressed um, and dated uh, for uh, March 10th. And this is regarding slotted floors, heavy use area protection. I will go through this letter quickly. Um, Corey is. Uh, with us here and, and certainly can um, speak to uh, this request. Montgomery County Soil and Water District received around 26 applications through the EPF. We have been working with the landowner on the implementation of his manure storage and heavy use area protection. I advised the landowner to visit a farm where we have completed many projects and he saw a slotted floor facility that was constructed last year. He'd like to construct a slotted floor heavy use area protection. Uh, I reviewed the round 26 policy that Bethany provided, and I also reviewed the heavy use area protection eligibility policy, 
and the requirements as described in the previous heavy use area covered barnyard screening tool. I've added the policy from the round 26 proposal, the definition of animal housing from the heavy use area eligibility policy and the previous requirement on the screening tool that required the district to describe the current animal housing situation. Round 26 did not require the district to describe the current housing situation, but it's still a very important planning tool to ensure our covered facilities do not become living space. Number one, round 26 policy, long-term manure storage is constructed under animal housing facilities or under barn storages are strictly prohibited through the Ag Point program. Definition from heavy use area eligibility policy, quote, animal housing, structurally sound livestock barn where animals are fed, sheltered from the weather and generally cared for must be available. Heavy use area protection screening tool, question 2C, quote, describe the current animal housing situations. Bethany um, did say that a slotted floor barn could not be constructed in round 26 um, as that uh, uh, follows the, the state committee's policy regarding under barn manure storage. However, it is um, Corey Nellis, it's my opinion that the heavy use area protection proposed in the contract is not a barn as defined by the eligibility definition. When we are planning a covered facility, we have to ensure there's proper animal housing available. Uh, this farm has four barns that he uses to house his animals. There's adequate barn space to house the animals. The proposed facility cannot be labeled as animal housing as defined in our screening tool. Therefore, it is my opinion that we could construct a slotted for barnyard at this farm. Uh, I'd like the committee to review the context of the policy to determine if the heavy use area protection is included in the reference uh, policy, the reference policy being um, um, under barn manure storages, as this committee um, did uh, pass a policy to prohibit uh, the funding for under barn manure storages for uh, safety concerns, for uh, livestock health concerns, and also for um, overall administrative concerns in regards to what the grant could pay for and what it could not. So just as a reminder, um, that is the policy that's in question. and. Um, the consideration here is whether a covered heavy use area of protection uh, could be defined under that policy. Corey, I'll let you uh, take it away from here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so the round 26 applicant did visit uh, with Mark Tamell's farm. We, were, we did fund a slot of floor facility before the policy was enacted. And, you know, I, I was been, uh, watching the facility and Scott Thickbaum did visit the facility with me as they're closing out this project. And it is a pretty impressive structure. So this one in particular does do animal housing. So the animals are there 24 seven. It is an open barn design, <clears throat> but you know, one of the things that I really was impressed by was the animals are clean. They've, he's removed 43,000 cubic feet of bedding, 200,000 gallons of water from the system, which, you know, decreases everything. Everything we want to do is to decrease the amount of waste coming off the farm. So a huge savings in manure spreading, manure application, clean water separation. So, you know, when I was, so when uh, the farm went out and looked at it, he said, wow, that thing is really impressive. And I talked to Mark about his facility and he said the animal health is, is actually higher. The animals are in better health. <clears throat> the air quality is better in that facility. And the only thing we haven't done yet is empty the structure. He did take three feet off the top here in December, but he has not uh, emptied the entire facility. So that was one of the other concerns about, you know, reading the policy that was in question was whether or not how, how this thing could be emptied. Um, so the real thing hinges, you know, the farmer asked for it. I said, they're not allowed. So he asked that I, you know, is there anything you can do? So I come to the state committee specifically to ask, you know, can we, put this facility in over here. So uh, that's why I'm coming to the state committee today. I, I am impressed with the structure. And I think, uh, you know, if you ask Scott a couple of questions on, I think he would tell you the same. It is a, and I would like to invite the state committee to come out and review the structure because I think it's a very plausible design and a very well put together structure and it does work really well. So the real question is, we have we cannot allow animal housing on our barnyards. So there's a strict definition that defines the barn as I put in the policy and a definition for heavy use area protection. So I think there may be a little bit of a gray area in the definition of what a barnyard is. And if we can put this slotted floor facility on this dairy farm. So the animals do go to the stanchion barn where they're milked and where they spend the majority of their time 
and they're not on pasture. So it's, you know, and I do have a, a rough draft that he got from an engineer that which that shows uh, two 14-foot scrape alleys and then a 20-foot feed alley down the center. So there's no beds. There's no, the way that this facility is set up <clears throat> or proposed, there's no opportunity for this facility to be converted to living space. It just doesn't have the, the way that it's just two, two feed alleys on either side of the feed alley down the center. So this particular facility couldn't be converted to living space the way it's designed. So I come to the state committee today to say, you know, is there a gray area in the policy? Is a heavy use area protection the same as a barn and, as defined in the policy? Thank you, Corey. I uh, appreciate that additional um, summary there. And you know, I, I just want to uh, put a couple of things out there for the committee voting members as we received this letter a little bit, uh, um, you know, later in the period between the last two meetings, um, taking into consideration the letter and, and, and Corey's summary. Um, perhaps there's an opportunity for us to uh, visit the site for us to do a little bit more research and for us to come back um, to the committee at our April meeting to to make a decision, Corey, would that impact the planning for the for the actual project? If we were to wait till the end of April for the committee to make a decision, or is it something that uh, um, you're looking for a quicker resolution? So we're, to... he's working with a private consultant right now, and he was meeting him the first week in March. So they did just send me the the uh, proposed structure, and then we're meeting with NRCS for a pre-design meeting on the 30th of March, and we're hoping to build this structure in July. So sooner the better. You know, I, I, if I don't have an answer today, then I just have to put it on the back burner for another month. So we, we'd lose a month in the planning process, and we we'll have to reschedule our pre-design meeting for the 30th. So <clears throat> there's a reason that this wasn't approved before. What what makes this design different than what wasn't allowed before that makes it so much better? I'm just, I don't know a lot about it. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> well, it's, just that. it's a barnyard only with a roof, which is required now versus it's not a housing complex. They have a tie stall. They keep all their animals in. So the conversation I had in the past with <clears throat> with uh, Scott was a, the, a lot of the concerns were we don't want to be building barns for animal that could be considered animal housing through the EPF. So you know, <laughs> we we had the question, and then you know with air quality concerns, but we got to this facility. We never had. I don't know. I think this is the only one in New York State. They're, they're popular out in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, but it's important, and I believe that it's important that we don't build animal housing. So I think, you know, when we talk about under barn storages, there's a concern with, with gases, the gas buildup. You know, Brian discussed a few of the concerns on why the policy was enacted in the first place, and Brian could reiterate those if necessary, but, you know, those were the the crux of it is the interpretation when people drive by the farm that you know the state the state did not pay for a living space for these animals is for water quality and water quality improvement projects so this is more a covered barnyard basically this is in essence this is definitely a covered barnyard yes okay okay no that that makes sense okay this is Scott again and, you know, it, um it, currently so it, they do have an outdoor feeding facility, but it's uncovered, so the feed is wet, and, it, you know, there's that manure runoff coming from the barnyard, so they're trying to eliminate this. So it's just basically going to be an improved facility as to what they have now. And this isn't the end of the story. If, if this was approved, you also have to equip money out here, so I would have to confer with Tom here in our office and Paul, and I don't know if Paul is on the line today or not, but... You know, I know I heard Blake was on the line, but you know, this would be an issue that would have to be brought before NRCS also, because I don't know, uh, we don't have any in the state. So I'm not sure there's a history to draw from on the federal side, you know, but 
the biggest thing is that NRCS will not pay for covered anything that can be considered living space either. So if I get if I understand this right, you're looking to do an an under barn storage in the out and and cover the outside feed area. So it's all it's not where the cows are living; it's where they're eating. Right. Yeah, they they come out. You know, right now they like Scott said, they come out and have 10,000 square feet of concreted area. That's the reason we're there. That's right above the stream. You know, so we're there to resolve that water quality issue. And we're already scheduled to build a manure storage and to have a use area protection. The farm saw this slot of floor barns and said, we can have both facilities in one spot. I save land. We save a lot of money on all aspects of maintenance. There's nobody scraping the alleys, no skid steer traffic, no manpower. So there's a lot of labor savings. But you know, they reduce so, the amount of water that they're spreading annually having a covered manure storage. Yeah. Like I said, you know, just at Mark Tamel, we save about 200,000 gallons of water, just, just rainwater, 39 inches over the surface area annually. So it's a, it's a big savings on that side of it. The real question is, you know, is it, a, is it could this be considered? Considered uh, underground heavy use area protection is it covered by the policy? And that's my question. Right. So the difference here is that um, this would not. This is not a barn. This would be a um, covered heavy use area. Covered heavy use areas we do fund. You know, by way of uh, specific policy, what we can actually um, fund through the grant, what needs to be considered as landowner match, or what cannot be funded. Um, so in this case. There would also be a slotted floor and a manure storage under that heavy use area. Um, can you tell me, Corey, uh, would, would that storage be under the entire um, uh, area and under that entire pad, or, or you know, would there be, you know, essentially, um, you know, storage that would would be under just portions of it, like you know, primarily where the uh, the animals would be congregating? No, it'd be under, so the way you got it set up, they got a 12 foot scrape alley and then a 20 foot feed alley. So the tractor would drive down the center and then a 12 foot scrape alley on the outside. So on both two sides of the structure would be just a scrape alley with headlocks and then a feed alley down the center. And underneath the whole thing, you'd have 12, 24, 30, 44 square, or 44 feet of storage. So the storage would go underneath that facility. And then he has a bedded pack barn on the north side of this structure, so that the bedded pack barn would stay. We'd have one roof covering the full structure. So the back part would be his bedded pack, and then he'd have on the front would be where, this, where he feeds his dairy cows. Right now, the heifers are in the bedded pack. You're basically putting a slotted floor under a feeding area. That is radically different than what we originally um, talked about Brian for barn and closed barn with cattle above it. That's a lot living above it, a lot different because we were talking about air quality being a severe issue with the cows living there. And it was in many of those original farms. Um, this is a lot different. How do you want to proceed? I think it's up to the, it's up to the voting members. You know, that, that's the question. Is it, is it different? Does it apply to our under barn manure storage? Uh, policy or does it apply more to a covered heavy use area? And, um, you know, there still would be some considerations of what could be paid for it and what couldn't be. But yeah. the prohibition is on the available to discuss. Is, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I don't know if Blake had an opinion on it from NRCS's side or not. I do not, not without going a little deeper on it. It, in, in I would like, um, I know it delays it a month, but I would like to have um, photographs or video of the site to look at. I had a meet at the meeting and vote on at the next meeting for a little better understanding of it with not just the site, but the barns behind it where you're looking at from the site in. So, instead of doing a um, on-site visit have if video or slides could be presented at the next meeting 
where we could discuss it a little more. It's awful. A little bit short term and quick right now and not sure right now, from my opinion. I'm not sure what the rest want to do. I mean, I, I like the idea. I like the idea of the efficiency and taking two projects and kind of making them into one. I just, <laughs> I like the efficiency. If there's some way we could make, you know, if it could happen, as long as it's working, as long as it works, you know, and it's not considered a, a, a living area and, you know, air quality isn't an issue. I, I like the idea, but I mean, yeah, I'd like to see um, maybe some pictures or something, a little bit more information, but. Brian, yeah, so I sent pictures. I sent pictures of the MMTs, the one that we finished. You know, I don't know what, if you want. I can send drafts of what they what they sent me for the uh, plan for the new facility. I mean, there's nothing there to take pictures of right now except a big empty concrete slab. Yeah, no, I understand. But I can, I can, I can. Yeah. I mean, you know. So, did you are you asking for pictures of the new facility at Tamales or the proposed site at Connard? I guess I can use names. It's not a secret. It's a public project, right? Well, the the proposed site as it sits by the barn, the, what and I guess I understand what you're looking for, um, Brian. What are we not allowed to fund under this definition? If if the uh, it's not which one, the under barn storage or the covered heavy use area? On a barn storage. Well, if it's a because this is really going to be a covered heavy use area, I think it's not an animal living st living place, so it's it's more of a covered heavy use area. So what are we allowed to fund? Hmm. Beth Bethany, do you um, can you pull up the covered heavy use area policy if you have it handy? Even just a quick summary of it. The general rule when I do a heavy use area protection, if my farmers want to subdivide the space, are you there? Hello? Yeah, we're still we're here. We're here. Oh, oh, I blacked out. So, you know, one of the, I, if they want to put headlocks in, I'll put a pipe rail in. But if they want to do headlocks because they're more expensive, I make them do that as landowner match. If they want to put a full electrical system in, you know, then we, we can. Do that as landowner match, but the, so it's pretty much I want the I want the manure contained inside the facility, and I tell them you can make as many pens or do you know you can't you can subdivide it for groups of heifers, groups of dairy cows. But you, I'm not going to pay for the interior subdivision. I'm not going to pay for the headlocks, and I'm not going to pay to have an electrician come in and wire the all the lighting systems in here. It's not a barn. It's not built to be a barn. You know, so we pretty much build a pole barn and I'll allow a water tub. So they can drink while they're while they're in the barnyard, but you know I make sure there's not a lot of amenities there, so we won't pay for those amenities. We just uh, thanks, Bethany. So we just pulled up the covered heavy use area policy, mm -hmm. and you can see there following generally what Corey was just talking about uh, what what components are eligible for cost share or land order match, which are only land order match and which are um, components are not at all eligible. And we also have um, lifespan uh, um, requirements, right? So, and, and that's, that, that's essentially to, um, you know, confirm with a farmer that this covered heavy use area cannot be converted to a barn at a later date. Under the lifespan, what is the alternative use? It says not allowed. That's right. Uh, I you think know, that being, would no bed. be referring to, yeah, using it for like uh, hay storage or, you know, the storage yeah, okay. of, um, you know, seasonal right. vehicle or something. Exactly. <clears throat>
under that, we can fund some of it. You're not going to fund a high percentage of it, I don't think. That that's that's right. Of course, then we you know would also be considering funding for portions of the actual manure storage structure that would be underneath this heavy use area. So going a, to go, you know, if we just go, did a barnyard, we pay for a concrete floor, buck walls, uh, poles and a roof, and then the manure storage. Obviously, we put the floor, the footers, and the walls up on a concrete storage. You know, so the only difference that we would have here was if there was a cost difference, it would be in a slot of floor. There's a post every 12 feet, and a footer under under the floor every 12 feet. So you have a little bit of extra money in the footer for the for the individual posts, and then the slot of floor might cost a little bit more than a regular poured floor. But each component individually, the roof, the posts, the manure storage, those would all be covered as per our standard practices. What's your opinion on this? Others? I think there's a there's a good argument to to be made that this plan structure does not fit the under barn manure storage policy. Um, but I also think there's some other things to consider, including, um, you know, plan maps and and whatever preliminary work that has been done so that we can ensure that indeed that that is the case that it would meet a heavy use area and a storage structure and wouldn't, uh, you know, now or some point in the future uh, be considered uh, livestock housing or, you know, a, bar a barn, um, in which case there would be a, a storage underneath. And, you know, and if you guys, if, if the committee recalls, we, we spent a considerable amount of time debating and discussing the merits of, of that kind of system. At the end of the day, we put out options in front of the committee um, and the option that was considered was, or that was, that was made, you know, the decision made was to uh, prohibit it under the Ag Nonpoint program um, for the reasons we stated before. So, in this case, we would have to ensure that it, indeed this is not an under barn storage. It meets the definitions of a covered heavy use area with a manure storage underneath. What I was going to suggest too is that uh, I did not propose the third Tuesday for our April meeting because that is uh, Easter uh, and and um, school vacation week. Currently, I have it proposed for later in the month, but we could go earlier in the month as well. You know, and I was going to make that suggestion later in the meeting. So, you know, that might benefit the the timing for this project. In which case, then, you know, we put our staff resources behind this, Corey. We either come out or or uh, review the the farm's plans we would um i believe there are some examples of this around the state but we'd want to uh, find out more about those and whether the ag point nrcs co-funded and, and in in which case then what what elements did they fund and how could this be designed to ensure you know adequate safety um as well as um, operation and maintenance um, you know concerns are, are addressed and how do you how do you get the manure out um are you lifting up the floor um uh uh cells or you know what 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 is what are the ultimate uh you know ways that uh you know that new that manure storage structure is going to meet uh you know all the um needs okay. for <clears throat> land application and transfer of manure how deep is the storage yeah. So the one at uh, MMT is a 12 foot deep storage. And okay. and that's got, it's, it's interesting because they put all the water pipes on the floor of the storage and they come off the post of the water. So it's like, you know, it's, it's an impressive structure. I'm, I was really impressed when you got it finished. And the only answer I don't have, I know with animal health, you 
air quality, all that seems to be better in this facility than his other locked facilities. But uh, he was supposed to empty the manure storage in uh, January, and then he moved it to February, and then he just took three feet off and put in a, a neighboring manure storage because of the weather and the timing. So, you know, I don't. I was hoping we would have this thing empty before I got to this uh, meeting with the state committee. So I could say, boy, it, it agitated great, it emptied great, fantastic. But I don't have, that's the only thing I'm missing right now is how it emptied. <coughs> but there's no, uh, you know, so he has, he does a high protein diet. So his, his uh, he's a beef farm and it's a very loose manure similar to dairy manure. It's different. So I, I don't know that there'll be any solid and there's no bedding at all. So there's nothing to soak up any of the moisture. So it's just the animal waste. So, you know, the nice thing about this, there's no bedding in it. There's no water. There's no excess outside water in it. So it's just animal waste. So there's really nothing that you have to bring back into suspension. So it'll be interesting to see how it empties this spring. Brian, I... And it is just, there's no access, there's no access ports. It's just, he has posts. There are, I think they're five foot by 12 foot slats. You pull one of the slats out, throw the agitation and pump equipment down through that flat and empty the facility. Being a beef diet it is radically different, <clears throat> excuse me, than a dairy diet. Brian, I'm in favor of having an early meeting or next month and um, have more information brought in on this. And the biggest reason to me is we already made policy against the dairy type facilities that were under barns. And I just need not sure that this is 100% different than that policy. There is a lot different, but um, I don't want to go right out against what we already agreed to without a, a more time for discussion, more information. If we had, if we weren't hadn't had that previous vote against doing this, then we wouldn't even be here. And but that complicates some. Um, I don't want to give the appearance we're just switching back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be a really good reason, um, you know, and it would be something we'd reflect in the minutes and and with any particular motion, you know, the distinction between this and and what uh, what would fall under the current under bottom oh. manure storage policy. All right, now what I'll do is I'll go ahead, Corey. Uh, I was just going to say I'll contact uh, Blake, or I'll contact, I'll have Tom run this up to uh, Rick Ronaldo and Paula and, and see if they're going to, if NRCS will consider it because it's a moot point if NRCS won't consider it, but I figured the state committee had a policy that said they wouldn't do an underground storage, so I'd start with you guys. And what we can do is uh, at the same time in conjunction with the state committees, we have an answer from NRCS because, you know, I wanted to, if your answer was going to be no today, then there's, it, I don't need to go to NRCS, but if we're going to do this, to, you know, we can do it together. So NRCS has an answer for us too, if that sounds practical. Okay. Yeah, that sounds. I think that sounds good. And, and uh, you know, Dale, I just would like like you like to make sure that all the rest of the voting members who can weigh in on that. But you know, essentially, right now, your recommendation is to you know table this discussion. Uh, we'll certainly work with Corey. We'll work with NRCS. We'll um, look at the specifics and and come back um, at our April meeting with that information, so that you can make just a decision yes or no. And we just do your April meeting earlier, like you talked about, if we can. Sure. We need a motion to table this or just gonna? So move. Second. There you go. Second. Voting. Uh, Darren? Aye. Dave? Aye. Scott? Pass. Carries. We will table it till next month, get a little better information. We'll move our meeting ahead next month so we can try to help accommodate the farm and the district and um, have a little better information and have it on first so we got a fair amount of time to discuss it at the next meeting. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your consideration. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, next on our agenda is state aid to districts. Ben. Yeah. Thanks, Dale. Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to briefly run through the uh, status of the state aid to districts reporting for 2021. Um, also touch on uh, some uh, recommendations for the voting members for 2022 and also uh, just brief thoughts on uh, where we're going for 2023. Um, so all the state aid reports for 2021 were in on time from all the 58 districts. That's 403 reports across the state. Uh, just like to say thank you to all the, your, all the districts for your hard work getting them completed, submitted on time, uh, and also thanks to the regional coordinators for uh, tracking down some of those last minute uh, reports that were still out there. Um, so part A, uh, eligible expenditures uh, is always the first report that I review uh, according to district law. That's the one that needs to be paid out first. Uh, part A is uh, 120 thousand dollars needs to be expended by districts on things like uh, staff salary uh, benefits uh, could be vehicles insurance uh, everything that's really not reimbursed by another state aid uh, program um, all the districts qualified for that for the sixty thousand dollars except for new york city new york city is eligible for uh, three hundred thousand dollars because it's made up of the, the five boroughs uh, they fell a little bit short of that uh, but all that money trickles down to Part C and then gets redistributed to all the districts uh, from there that earn the Part C money. Um, so the, all the reports were in. Uh, I reviewed all the reports. They followed up with the districts on certain things. Just there's a few questions here or there, like there is every year on whether certain items were eligible or just needed some further clarification uh, based on the descriptions that were on the reports. Uh, so got through all of those and all those payments have been fully processed by the state uh, and all the $60,000 should be in the bank accounts currently of all the soil and water districts as of uh, last week. Um, uh, next, we move on to Part C performance measures, uh, which we know that holds the largest pot of money uh, for state aid to districts and for uh, same general process processes, part A, reviewed all the reports. There was some follow-up needed with the districts, got all the information back from them in a pretty quick turnaround. Um, and all the districts um, were approved for the full amount. And this year that number was $122,005.26. Uh, that's quite a, quite a large number, um, mostly due to the EPF increases. Also, like I said, a few, you return funds from Part B last year and the trickle down from Part A uh, for New York City not earning all that number. So that $122,000 number is a little over $9,100 increase or 7.5% uh, increase over 2020. So it's a pretty, pretty good jump there again uh, for districts. Um, so th that process again follows very similar to Part A. I receive all of those, all the uh, reports from the districts. All of that information is consolidated into a large spreadsheet where it's compared um, against the standard. Um, and obviously the last couple of years, we've been using the revised COVID performance measures. What we decided to do in April of 2020, after the pandemic started, we uh, met, had lots of discussions about revising the COVID or the performance measures uh, just in case there was going to be those difficulties from districts um, meeting those those performance measures, but the, the standard performance measures, and it was a good thing we did. Um, there's been some issues uh, across the state still meeting those those normal standard performance measures, but not in meeting the COVID revised ones. So um, I'll go into a little bit more of that on the next slide. Um, so with the process for paying that, where the Part A one we uh, we uh, look at and receive those COVID, the COVID, the uh, claim for payments up front in the performance measures part C, we uh, 
we get those after the fact um, by sending an email memo out to the districts and receiving those back in a pretty quick turnaround. This year we see, received them all back from the districts within three days, which is a very quick turnaround. Um, but being that we're always up against the blackout period of the state, uh, we have to get those really quick and, and get them paid out on time. So uh, again, thank you for the districts for getting those in so quickly on that short tur turnaround. Um, and those have all been processed as well. I've sent them down to fiscal and they've forwarded them on to the BSC and OSC for review. So even possibly this week, those payments should be hitting the uh, bank accounts of the districts. Um, so yeah, 2022, um, I guess state committees kind of were, did staff are making the recommendation to keep the performance measures requirements the same again for 2022 as they have been since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we just really don't want to negatively affect any of the districts uh, who may not be able to fully implement their usual programs, projects, and partnerships. And, and that was kind of backed up just uh, based on um, late in 2021, early 2022, what we were seeing as far as the positivity rates of COVID. It was kind of hard to predict, you know, where things were going to go. Um, also, it's kind of hard to predict um, where things are going to go this year now that the restrictions have been lifted. Obviously, everybody's hoping that the rates remain low and that the impacts, you know, are very low on, on districts and all the other partner agencies. Uh, but we are still hearing some concerns, or we have been in the last couple months before the rates really dropped off, about districts not being able to meet the, you know, the normal um, performance measures, just uh, whether partners just aren't there, you know, some things are really beyond their control, uh, programs still aren't moving forward, whether it's at the district level, county level, state level. Um, so there still has been some, some struggles in that, even though we know most districts are all trying to get everything implemented just as if COVID never hit, um, there, there are still those struggles out there. Um, and those sentiments are being echoed by what the performance measure reports have showed over the last two years. So even this year, after looking at the performance measures data that was submitted by the districts, um, roughly half of the districts would not have achieved those pre-COVID performance measure requirements. Um, there's certain ones that definitely stand out way above the rest of them. Some of them are still uh, easily completed. Um, but other ones, uh, such as the uh, state, regional, uh, federal meetings, that performance measure 1G that has always been hard for districts to accomplish, uh, almost half of the state still didn't qualify for that one. Um, whether, you know, the full effort wasn't there in some cases, uh, that is a possibility. Uh, but there's also other ones that had, uh, you know, one, two board members that completed um, one of those tri uh, meetings, uh, but they still fell short. They didn't have, you know, a third, a third uh, board member completing that in many cases. Um, so, so it looks like the effort was there, and you know, in most cases across the state. Um, but again, we don't want to negatively affect districts at this time if uh, if they're still having a hard time completing those performance measures. And you know, we are a few months obviously into 2022, and uh, to change things at this point may be. Um, you know, a little bit uh, negative or hurtful to the districts to do it at, at this point. Um, but uh, last slide, Bethany, you know, what we are looking to do for the future um, for 2023 is just to hold a few, well, at least one, probably multiple state aid meetings with district involvement. We'll also have internal discussions with the staff, obviously, use the performance measures data that we have um, to, and use all those meetings and everything to look forward to 2023, decide what changes we're going to make, what um, performance measures we're going to put in back into place and even, even you know, um, boost them to take them further than they were before, um, given the amount of money that districts are, are now receiving through Part C. Um, you know, I think it's, it's uh, understandable that the requirements may be, have to be a little bit more stringent than they they were before. Um, so we're going to do those things in 2023 and have a plan, you know, well in advance of, of the end of this year um, as to what we're going to be expecting in 2023 moving forward. Um, so that's 
kind of a brief rundown of where everything stands now and what we're th thinking. Um, as it says on the agenda, you know, you know, please any discussion that anybody wants to bring up on this um, and feedback from the voting members would be would be welcomed. Um, but ultimately, what we're looking for is a, a motion um, from you on just how you would like to move forward with this on 2022, whether you know keep everything the same uh, for the reasons that I laid out there, or uh, if you would like to uh, revise anything going forward for this year. That's all I have, unless you got anything to throw in there, Brian. I don't, Ben, that was well well covered. Thank you. Lee, we need more information than we already have. I think it should be carried on the way it are for another year until we get through this COVID better. We've got, we're already partly into this year with some severe problems in it. I don't think you, you can't be holding districts feet to the fire when we've had, we're still not out of the COVID yet, my opinion. Yeah, th so there's three out of the four quarters of this year might be might be a little bit more yeah. back to normal. But uh, as Ben reflected, the first quarter was was tough. You know, we're not quite through it yet. Um, and you know, if we were going to change something, we we also you know really should have done so at the start of the year. And uh, you know, that's what we're um, that's what we're intending to do for for 2023. So this would be the year. We haven't had a performance measure summit in a while, as we used to call them. I would call it whatever you want, but uh, you know, uh, meeting or meetings with districts to to go over the performance measures, not just the recommendation of percentages that the committee gets to decide across the the performance measures, but also what should those uh, measures be. You know, um, are there new categories, not new categories, but are there new elements, the categories that could be added, or um, you know, districts would need to achieve more than the minimum number of those elements, you know, things like things like that, you know, we've had good success in collaborating with districts in the past to bring, you know, good performance measure program to the committee for consideration. That's what we're intending to do this year, which would then um, that clock would start January 1 of 2023. everyone else. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd agree with it too. Yeah. Although COVID is kind yeah, of status quo. Well. Yeah. Although COVID seems to be kind of COVID itself seems to be kind of dissipating a little bit. The effects of it are still <laughs> lingering, unfortunately. So yeah, good point. Yeah. And, you know, I think that we did learn a little bit too over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, there's, I believe, going to be some legislation on open meetings law. And, you know, I think there will be continued uh, opportunities for remote meetings, uh, remote events and trainings, but also, you know, a hybrid of the two um, for which, you know, we can certainly uh, have districts take full advantage of. Uh, but, but yeah, Darren, good point. I mean, we might be tailing off on the infection rates, but the impacts are, are still being felt. Yeah, I believe it's too early to change our policy, what we've had for COVID, um, when it comes to the performance measures that we hold off, uh, um, year until we can get on a better footing on how the state's going to allow meetings to run and everything going forward into the future. You want a motion to maintain it for another year, Brian? All right. Like a motion yeah, that, in that order to maintain our present status when it comes to the performance measures that we have had through COVID for one more year. I moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Go to voting. Darren? I. Dave? Aye. Aye. Voting. Thank you. Scott? Yes. We maintain it for another year and hopefully by then the state will have a lot better um, guidance and rules out on what we need to do. Anything else, Ben? Nope, that's it, Dale. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, Bethany, ag non-point source.
Great. Thank you, Dale. Um, I will just start with a uh, quick uh, program status update for the committee. Um, so far this year in 2022, we've completed 15 contract closeouts. Seven time extension amendments have been approved and one landowner change uh, amendment has been approved. Um, we recently received notification from our fiscal management division that all of the round 26 contracts have now been fully executed. There were um, five contracts that still were <clears throat> uh, kind of going through the process, but now those uh, have been fully executed. So we are working on getting notifications out to districts uh, regarding those contracts so those projects can move forward. Um, with those, um, now that all of the round 26 contracts have been fully executed, uh, the Ag Nonpoint Source Program is currently managing approximately 200 active contracts for a total of $69 million. <clears throat> Um, we also recently received approval from the Office of the State Comptroller uh, regarding our round 27 of Ag Source funding. Um, with each uh, round of funding, we are required to submit what's called a procurement record down to the Office of the State Comptroller uh, for review. So um, they can confirm that uh, our solicitation uh, was carried out and in accordance with um, you know, their requirements and um, they go through everything from our RFP to our ranked list to uh, and review all of our, our processes and procedures. Um, we recently received approval for the round of funding. So we um, have been given the green light to go ahead with the round 27 contracts. And I believe as of yesterday, we have uh, submitted 41 out of 43 contracts down to our fiscal management uh, division. And uh, those will hopefully uh, start the, the processing uh, procedures uh, as soon as possible and we'll get those moving and, and out to districts as soon as we can. Um, and regarding, uh, I'll just kind of go right into the round 28 um, status update. Uh, so regarding round 28, we are, are still in um, the open uh, question and answer period for um, that particular RFP. Uh, I believe the last date to submit questions for the RFP is the beginning of April and um, the deadline to submit proposals uh, for round 28 is uh, May 2nd. Are there any uh, additional questions regarding the Ag Nonpoint Source Program? Hey, Bethany, there was just a question in the chat. I'm not sure who it is okay. from. Is it possible to see a list of those round 27 projects? I believe we have a list of those with the round 27 press release, correct? Uh, yes, that was um, those are project descriptions for, for all the projects that were funded was uh, sent out with that press release. Uh, and certainly if there are any further you know, questions regarding round 27 projects specifically, um, I encourage uh, anyone to send me an email and we can um, work to address those if possible. And I will, um, when I get done here, I can put my email in the chat for, for anyone who may wanna reach out. So I do have um, two amendments to present to the, the committee today for consideration. Um, they are both time extension amendments and both of them have been uh, reviewed by their respective um, regional AEA and uh, both have been supported by those AEAs. Um, we'll just kind of follow the, the format for these two that we've been um, following for the past uh, 
couple of months, I will, you know, indicate the district in the round and what they are, you know, what type of request they're looking for. And then um, if the committee has any questions, uh, we can uh, address those. So our first amendment uh, request was submitted by Erie County for a round 24 contract. Uh, they are looking for a one year time extension for a new end date of March 1st, 2023. Questions or comments on it? approved, please. So move. Second. Moved and seconded. We'll go to voting. Darren? Aye. Dave? Aye. Scott? Yes. Approved. Thank you. Next. Okay, our next amendment um, and our final uh, time extension amendment for for this month was submitted by Washington County Soil and Water Conservation District uh, for a round 24 project. They are uh, seeking a two year time extension for this contract uh, and the new end date would be March 1st, 2024. Um, I did reach out to um, Ryan Cunningham, regional AEA, regarding this request, um, just because a two-year time extension is a little atypical, uh, but the district um, has been working uh, steadily along with this farm and is just uh, trying to anticipate uh, what may happen going into this construction season and uh, next construction season. and. Um, anticipating that there will still be some delays for the implementation of the remaining practices. Questions, discussion, anyone? Approved, please. I'll move. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. We'll go to voting. Aaron? Aye. Dave. Aye. Scott? Yes. Approved. Thank you. Anything else, Bethany? No. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the CRF, Jennifer. Thank you, Dale. Um, I am going to first go over um, some program status, and then I do actually have a research proposal with a, a PowerPoint that we'll review um, as well today, which is a, a new addition to the agenda today. Um, so for 2021, we had 16 closeouts, and uh, we do have a bunch coming in for 2022. I'll give you an update on those numbers next month. Um, for round five, as of this week, we have all of the round five contracts executed now. Um, there were two pending since um, last meeting, so those have now all been executed, which is um, great news that all of those projects can um, now move forward. Uh, I don't have any amendments today for uh, the state committee's consideration. Um, and a quick uh, update on round six, which is the current RFP that is open, um, the Q&A for that uh, has actually closed. Um, the final Q&A was posted on March 11th, and we had almost three times as many questions than from round five, so um, a lot of interest. Uh, so that's great news for um, our increased funding amount of eight million for this round. Uh, so the uh, amount of interest hopefully uh, shows that we'll also have a, a great increase in the amount of applications uh, for round six. Uh, round six is due March 28th at the end of this month, which is coming up. And as I said, there is 8 million available, which is um, uh, double of what we had for round five. Um, so that's all I have as a program um, status update. 
if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those now. If there aren't any questions, then um, I do have a, a research proposal that I'm going to uh, present today. So I'll go ahead and share. Sorry about that. Give me one second. No, nope, that didn't do it either. Okay. So this is um uh, a research proposal that I'm going to be requesting a motion to util utilize some available funding um, under our CRF program uh, for emission measurement and monitoring. Um, so we had um, in state fiscal year 2020, 2021 and 2021, 2022, uh, we had uh, combined the two the two years of funding of 4.3 million and 4.5 million uh, together to to manage uh, as as one in 8.8 .8 million. And last year at our March uh, 2021 state committee meeting, uh, the state committee approved the following funding allocation. Um, so we allocated 8 million uh, for CRF round six uh, cost share grants and uh, put aside 800,000 for potential pilot projects. Um, any, any kind of pilot projects that came up or tool development such as greenhouse gas quantification tool development. Um, so those were just some ideas we had and now uh, we're coming to the state committee with, uh, with a solid proposal to, to utilize some of those funding. Um, so previously we've had and discussed um, some, some research that has been presented to us um, on methane um, gas detection and leak detection. Um, it was presented to us by a, a research team including Cornell Cal's, uh, Pro Dairy, and Ithaca College. Um, this would be a full three-year uh, funded project and we would actually be partnering uh, AGM and the state committee would be partnering with DEC on this. Um, so both uh, parties would provide technical support under this contract as well as funding support. Um, so DEC would be providing some of the funding to support this uh, research. Uh, the estimate for, for the funding uh, needed would, is about 700,000, um, which may increase as we refine the scope of work. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, we will be uh, uh, working with DEC to, to both put in some funding for this. Um, so the, the project is really based on methane and ammonia emission monitoring and measurement with optical gas imaging cameras and concentration meters in backpack analyzers uh, from various uncovered manure storage types such as raw liquid manure storages separated liquid manure storages, digested manure storages, digested separated manure storages, as well as co-digested manure and food waste storages and co-digested separated manure and food waste storages. So looking at a, a broad range of, of the types of storages and uh, really detecting the methane and ammonia emissions from, from those sources. Uh, so the research would also determine methane leakage from anaerobic digesters and covered manure storages. We had previously mentioned to the state committee that um, this is something that this research team has been looking at, but this uh, funding would help support really diving into and expanding the amount of farms that they're looking at and, um, and really uh, uh, getting, getting more out of what, what they've uh, started to do already. Um, this would also include ammonia and enteric methane measurement from barns uh, through mapping of emissions. 
Um, so they have some really cool technology and they'll be able to uh, really show us um, how much uh, emissions are coming from these sources as well as you know where where those are through um, mapping out uh, where those emissions are on on a farm. So the project outcomes would be uh, greenhouse gas inventory calculations of various types of stored manure, including those with methane mitigation practices. Uh, this would help inform our statewide greenhouse gas inventory, uh, as well as uh, allowing us to know uh, within agriculture, helping on, on a farm scale, uh, what these uh, sources are, are really putting out. Um, and to date, uh, some of this has really just been estimated and modeled, and these would be um, actual uh, measurements. Uh, this would also help uh, or improve a uh, sense of ammonia emissions based on actual measurements. Uh, so they'd be looking at methane and ammonia. And then ultimately this would help develop a leak detection protocol and leak correction solutions for cover and flare systems and anaerobic digesters. And ultimately this would really help uh, support uh, the, the cover and flare systems that we're putting in, as well as looking at existing anaerobic digesters uh, looking at the leak detection and putting in place um, some correction solutions that can be utilized uh, by farms and even having a protocol that um, that could be utilized without having to necessarily do uh, leak detection on every farm. Um, so this would be very helpful to uh, both DEC's efforts and Ag and Market's efforts to meet CLCPA goals and methane reduction um, on, on, in agriculture. So it's really just kind of a quick proposal. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to talk about them, but we just want a motion to, uh, to help uh, or to fund uh, and expand this research uh, with some of the funding that uh, the state committee has already allocated to, to go towards um, these kind of projects. And part of their initial research at, um, for trial at our farm and the leaks they detected um, told me that design changes need to be done on the coverers and flares. And uh, I think this is gonna be needed, especially where the state is going to fund a lot of covers that we may uh, proposals for the manufacturers on how they need to design changes due to the research. I think this is needed. Yeah, as well as design changes to the, um, you know, potential uh, to really up our operation and maintenance, uh, you know, on these systems too into the future. It, and I just, Jennifer, that was an excellent, excellent synopsis. Um, but I just want to also say that, you know, we'll be working with the, uh, the PIs for this in the weeks ahead um, to, you know, put a little bit more detail around the scope and the budget, but we also didn't want to miss an opportunity uh, at this meeting so that we could get direction from the committee to move ahead with the development of, you know, the, the actual, um, you know, scope and budget for this project, of course, with the EC as a co-funder and a partner in all of this. So, mm -hmm. you know, what we would likely do with a, a motion today is, is uh, continue those discussions, get a little bit more detail and refinement to that scope and budget, and then we would bring back um, updates to the committee over, over time. And anyone questions? Like a motion to move forward on on this to develop it further, working with DEC to finalize it so that we can get this moving forward. So move. Second. second. Moved and seconded. We'll go to voting. Darren. Hey. Dave. Scott. Yes. Anything else, Jeff and Jennifer? No, that was all I had today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will keep you updated um, on this project as we move forward with it. And um, no, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, voting staff advisory reports will 
start with uh, Dave. You got anything? I got nothing. Aaron? Excuse me, I did have sure. a question. Go ahead. Is, are you doing any research on helping farms transition from liquid manure systems, which release a great deal more um, methane and ammonia than to pasture-based systems? Than to pasture-based systems. Oh, it, what was your question about it again with the pasture-based um, systems? It's, it's, it's in the, it's in the, go ahead. go ahead. My question is, are you doing any research on that, on how to help farms convert? So, We're not, I can help answer that. Go ahead, please. Um, on, under AIM, we are, um, Support and as well as our uh, CRF um, and uh, agricultural uh, resources, uh, they do help support uh, cost share support. of uh, pasture-based systems. We do um, so. We do we do support farms that um, want to to move in that direction or or already uh, using pasture-based systems. Um, there isn't any uh, current research that we're supporting for that, but we are supporting the actual um, implementation of of those. Uh, systems. Hopefully that answers will be, some will of you your Will you be question. comparing the, um, the emissions from the anaerobic digester systems and pasture-based systems in the study that you are undertaking? On this study that we'll be I'm undertaking, I'm assuming it won't, it'll be, it will not, pasture-based operations will not be involved in this specific study. I have read on other studies that I have compared the two that have been done, that have compared pasture-based um, gases compared to um, non-pasture-based gases. And, and there have been some studies done on them. It just, this one here is only based on um, non pasture based farms. Any further questions, anyone? And anything to report? I don't, I don't have anything. No. Scott? No, I don't believe anything. Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so I'll go through a uh, list of advisory members and um, just please take your phone off mute if you have anything to report to the committee. Uh, following that, I will ask uh, if any conservation district uh, um, uh, members are on the call if they'd like to report or ask questions of the committee and then certainly, um, you know, anybody else um, from the general public. So uh, starting off, I don't believe there's anybody from Ag and Markets, but in case they came in late after roll call, Ag and Markets. I, I guess I could take one quick opportunity to give an Ag and Markets update. Um, just also, I, I dropped it in the chat, but I uh, wanted to remind everybody that the um, Climate Action Council uh, website has um, um, links to um, process for which uh, the public can comment on the draft uh, scoping plan. Again, the uh, timing for that is the, the draft is out currently. There will be a series of uh, public hearings, both in person and virtual, and um, staff uh, from DEC and NYSERDA will be going through all of the comments. and. Uh, the Climate Action Council will continue deliberations on that draft scoping plan the remainder of this year and um, in the effort to get the uh, scoping plan finalized by January uh, 1st, 2023. Okay, um, moving on, is anybody on from Cornell Cows have anything to report? Okay, CDEA. Dustin, you still on? I'm here, Brian, but apparently they picked right now to start doing some major drilling on our building, so I'll be quick. 
Okay. Uh, we're in the middle of water quality symposium. So that's uh, that's going very well. I'm looking forward to seeing hopefully most of the folks at the uh, annual meeting next Tuesday afternoon. I'll be sending out the announcement for that today and asking uh, Maureen Irish to send that out to the whole state as well. Uh, and that's about it for now since we're wrapped up with water quality. Excellent. Thank you, Dustin. Okay, I'm not sure if Beth, Beth Claypool has come back. She had to step away for a minute. Beth, point on cooperative extension. Okay, DEC. Hey, Brian, this is Julie. Um, I just had a quick um, thing that I wanted to report. Um, so I sit on the task force for the Great Lakes Sediment and Nutrient Reduction Program. Um, and we just released an RFP recently. Um, it's for projects for agricultural nonpoints, stormwater, and Great Lakes shoreline or stream banks. Um, it's like $200,000 cap, but it's really nice federal match for state projects. Um, and applications are due on April 22nd at 5 p.m. Um, there is a webinar um, for the project, or excuse me, for the program on March 24th. Um, and I just put info in the chat if you are interested, but feel free to contact me. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else for the EC? This is Sarah. I'm all set, Brian. Thanks. Thank you. I don't have anything, Brian. Okay, department. Okay, thank you, Julie. Uh, department of Health. Um, I don't have anything. Do it. I don't know if Paul okay. does. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Paul? Uh, nothing to report, Brian. Excellent. Thank you. Department of State, Stephanie? Um, no, not really. We're working towards uh, developing the request for applications for the next round of the CFA. Um, it likely come out, of course, this is all tentative, but, you know, the schedule is fairly similar to last year in May, and we're um, pulling together a request for applications for both the local waterfront revitalization program, the smart growth comprehensive uh, planning program, and the Brownfield Opportunity Area Program. So that should hopefully be out in a couple months. That is it. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Questions or comments for Stephanie? Okay, SUNY ESF, Steve? Hi, Brian. No, I don't have any updates today. Thanks. All right, thank you. I, I know that they are, I'm sorry, Blake had to step away, but anyone else from NRCS on and have an update? Okay, um, I will ask staff to go ahead and take your phone off mute. And if you have an update for the committee, please go ahead. Hey, Brian, this is Bethany. I do have an uh, um, additional update for the committee. <clears throat> um, I wanted to share with the group um, that we have um, been able to make a second award to a soil and water conservation district through the source water buffer program. Um, just to kind of to revisit that program, um, that was something that came out of the Clean Water Infrastructure Act of 2017, and it gave uh, the state committee the authority to provide cost share assistance um, by through soil and water districts for the purchase of conservation easements on agricultural land for the purpose of uh, pr protecting active sources of public drinking water. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were able to um, officially award Essex County Soil and Water Conservation District uh, just over $200,000 for the purchase of a 16.6 acre conservation easement that will permanently protect agricultural land along Cold Brook, which is a tributary to Lake Champlain. Um, Essex County 
will be working with the Adirondack Land Trust um, for the purposes of um, maintaining and um, enforcing the actual conservation easement. Um, in addition to uh, the protection of this area, um, approximately 16.2 acres of forested buffer will be implemented uh, through this project in addition to um, uh, or additionally, the project will will improve uh, stream crossings to allow for aquatic passage, uh, reduce erosion along the stream bank, and uh, restrict livestock access from the stream. I believe uh, the department has been working on a social media post that will go out uh, regarding this specific project. Um, so hopefully, if we do have a couple more, we'll actually be able to. Uh, put out a, an official press release uh, to announce a number of different projects. Fantastic, Bethany. Thank you for that um, update. That's really excellent to hear, 16-acre buffer site. That's a very, very large buffer. Um, really uh, looking forward to uh, many more applications and uh, many thanks go out to Essex County Soil and Water District for um, you know, their work, uh, I know these are kind of longer term, um, you know, project proposals um, from, you know, first concept to this point. So it does take a little bit of time. I think we're learning, but um, their persistence has paid off and the partnership as well up there with the land trust. So that's great to hear. Um, I should also uh, mention too, not only the Essex working with the Adirondack Land Trust, but the Nature Conservancy um, is also a uh, committed a, um, a considerable amount of funding to this particular project. So, um, you know, I think they have a, a very good three-way partnership up there to, to get these projects on the ground. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. I had to switch uh, to uh, charging my phone here for a moment or two. Um, so I'm not uh, using my headset. I actually can take these out of my ears. Okay, anybody else staff report? Brian, everybody, uh, good morning. This is Greg Albrecht. Hi, A couple Greg. just uh, strict AIM, good morning, AIM base uh, updates. Uh, thank you and hats off to all the districts who sent uh, their AIM round 16 final report packages in at the end of the month. We are actively reviewing those and we'll be back in touch if we haven't already. Um, and in regards to AIM-17, Bethany did a master class that a, a summary of the process that uh, that awards moved through to contract within the state system. And we have some good news on the AIM-17 front as well in that its procurement record was also approved last week, which means that it has uh, a couple of steps per the uh, you know, internal internal controls set up by the Office of the Comptroller uh, before um, AIM-17 contracts are, email, are mailed to districts. But uh, that's a good sign that we're allowed to now take those steps and uh, our partners in fiscal and uh, our council's office uh, now are actively working on those AIM-17 contracts. We still don't have a uh, a date to give you on when those will arrive, but uh, we're getting closer, uh, so stay tuned. And I will keep it at Thank that. You. A lot of things going on, though. There are, Greg. Thank you. I will also say um, thank you and, and uh, to you and, and to all the districts uh, engaged in the um, AIM Base 16 Tier 4 BMP Showcase. I know I messed up that title. Um, that uh, was one of the courses that uh, officially kicked off the virtual symposium um, that was held yesterday. I was thoroughly impressed uh, with those presentations. Hope to bring some of that information um, back to the committee um, sometime soon. Brian, a, a quick right. update on uh, AEM and CNMP planning. So just... Yes, sir. Um, just to update, um, the first full week of April, we're, we're doing our CNMP training, which is this year going to be a three-day long training held down at Cornell, both in-person and virtual. 
we just wanted to share that it's our largest um, registration at 76 attendees at this point. And, you know, what great help from our partners at NRCS that are kind of co-teaching this with us and, and supporting us um, merging the two programs and teaching alongside each other. Um, that's kind of, that was the goal of this. We work on planning of all different tiers and sizes and resource management areas and trying to keep, you know, foster those partnerships. Um, and also bringing in some DEC folks to just really spend a lot of time together on everything CNMP on our livestock farms. Thank you. And it's great to hear. Wow, 76. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other staff reports? Okay, um, any conservation district uh, uh, personnel on the line that would like to give a report or ask a question of the committee? Okay, any, any public comments um, from anyone on the line and or um, any more questions from, from partners? Okay, um, hearing none, Dale, back to you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, we will, um, our next meeting, we want to look at, we you looking at April 12th, do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, apologies there for, um, <clears throat> you know, that uh, a little discrepancy there at the end of the agenda, but since, uh, you know, we you know, had that conversation with Corey earlier and, and um, knowing that uh, the third Tuesday is uh, Easter and, uh, and um, uh, school break yeah. week, how about we look at Thanks. April 12th? The other voting members, what a uh, complex, or what do you think? Looks all right for me. It, uh, so far, it work, so far, yeah. it looks all right for me, Dale. I okay. got my knee in action. I don't think they're going to operate, but I don't know when. I have no idea. At least sooner the better. But Scott, what do you think? I spent three years. <laughs> and I spent a night in the hospital, and I don't like that nonsense for nothing. <laughs> and Phil the next day and got hurt. So what do you do? But I will do my best if I can get there, or if I can set up someplace to home if I can't get out. Okay, Dave, Scott. Uh, the twelfth is good for me. The only one thing is, um, the farm that Montgomery County is my neighbor, so if I have to yep. recuse from a vote. Yeah, I fully understand. Yeah, I think, yeah. Th thank you for that, Scott. I I think in this case, you know, maybe an abstention is the most appropriate, but we can we can uh, yeah. think about that and good. discuss between now and then. But a field full recusal is probably not necessary. That means you you be not in the in the virtual room or the meeting room when we have the discussion, but maybe an abstention on the vote. But thank you for reminding uh, yeah. us about that. As long as, as long as you know. Perfect. Thank you. Good. All right. And I'll, April uh, I'll email or text, I'll email or text Erica to, to give her the date and hopefully she can attend as well. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um Anything else anyone wants to bring up before we adjourn? I I, I hate to do this. I will I will say there's one more Go thing ahead. I should have reported on earlier uh, since we have just a few minutes. Um, the staff have been working with uh, DEC, Cornell, and, and SUNY SF and, and, and other partners to um, look into what's called the USDA's Climate Smart Commodities Grant Program. And this okay. is a pilot initiative that um, is uh, 
they're making a total of one billion dollars available to states to establish um, uh, climate smart commodities. So essentially, getting implementation funding out to farms for a host of practices that um, have a greenhouse gas carbon sequestration resiliency benefit, as well as um, focusing in on measurement quantification monitoring and verification of those practices. And then the third aspect of this is translating that into market, so end use. Um, it's a big, big program where there are two solicitations in this. Um, the first uh, is a um, minimum of a $5, five million dollar request up to $100 million. The second is uh, 250000 to four point nine. Nine nine million, and you know, essentially for New York State, this would help us really catalyze and springboard um, the resources necessary for um, the state to uh, help meet our our climate goals. So, looking at the scoping plan, agriculture and forestry combined um, into this solicitation. So, it's an opportunity for us to get federal resources into the state to supplement what we're currently doing and also expand on that um, into those two other elements, uh, verification, monitoring, quantification, measurement, as well as, um, you know, translating that out into uh, markets. Um, How long is this tuned? program? Well, it's, it's five years, and there's a, there's a potential for two-year extension, yep. so five to seven years. Um, a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of time uh, for proposals. Initially, the due date was early April. They did extend it a month to early May. So that's helpful, considering the um, collaboration that's necessary with our partners to put together a big comprehensive proposal for the state of New York, rather than um, you know two separate proposals, one for the ag and one for forestry. We really are looking at putting together one proposal for um, this effort. There are numerous other uh, uh, eligible entities out there, and, and uh, we um, have had a few discussions, communication with, with folks, not-for-profits, NGOs, and others. Uh, likely that will continue um, until the due date, so there could be opportunities for us to support and partner on other, other applications as well. So I will, um, you know, I think I have an earlier April meeting good. Um, for bringing back more details to the committee as we develop them. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to mention that. And uh, it's unfortunate Blake had to leave the leave the meeting, but um, you know this is a substantial opportunity and uh, you know a way to supplement funding we currently have and certainly expand on that uh, as we move forward with our climate goals. Excellent. Great, great opportunity. Don't mess up on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Try not to. <laughs> anything else, anyone? All right, we're adjourned, and um, thank you, everyone, and we will see you all April 12th, if not before. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care now. Thank you. Take care.